So again, uh, thank you for thank you for joining us. Um, thank you for joining us on this Sunday, and and it is it is a great Sunday, a great day, uh, just to to come and worship worship the Lord. And we're continuing our series on the book of Mark, and I think it's really simple as we go through this series, the, the more I read the book of Mark and I, I read, I've read now Mark chapter one, probably like 10 to 20 times, you know, it's just over and over reading a rel- relatively really short chapter in terms of just, there's so much that happens in this one chapter. And as I'm um, really reading this book, I think for me, it's, it's understanding this book is an outline of what it means to be a disciple of Christ to be a follower of Jesus and why you should be a follower of Jesus. It answers those questions. Uh, it answers the question of who is Jesus. It answers the question of what it means to be a disciple. It answers the question of how you are supposed to be a disciple. Um, it answers the question of why. Why why we, we, follow, we follow Jesus because of what he's done. It answers these questions very straightforward. And, and, if, and if you can, during this time, just read the book of Mark. Just read it slowly with me. Uh, read it as, as we're reading through it in terms of uh, just see how, how kind of straightforward it is. It doesn't have all the fluff uh, that, that Matthew and Luke does in terms of describing the details. It gets really to the nitty gritty. It gets to the brass tacks of, of, what, of what it means to follow Jesus, of what Jesus did. And, and it's very instructive in terms of a timeline and outline of, of the ministry of Christ. But I think as I read it and I see what Mark is getting at, it talks about following Jesus, about what it was like to be in the the shoes of the disciples, what it was like to to see Jesus do all these crazy miracles. And they were crazy. It was was outstanding. It was awesome. All these different things that Jesus would do. And so as we go through this book, I, I want you to, have that in the back of your mind of what Mark is trying to teach you. Mark is trying to teach you what it means to be a follower of Christ, to be a disciple of Christ. And if you're not a Christian, if you're not someone who calls yourself a Christian or wants to be a disciple, what I would ask or I would pray for for you is not that you have to commit your life to Jesus. Because I think in our understanding of what it means to be a disciple, without understanding what Mark is trying to get at, we think of being a disciple of Jesus is as being a radical, as being someone who is is completely sold out, is is just this like, you know, fully on fire, on fire for the Lord, willing to to sell everything and, and go follow Jesus. And at one point, that is what a disciple is. But what Mark Mark is trying to explain is is that it's not as radical as it may seem. Selling all your possessions and following Jesus seems very radical. It seems crazy. And so what happens is if we're not a believer, if you're not someone who knows Jesus, then you look at Christians and you're like, they're crazy. They're insane. Why would they drop everything and follow this dude, this guy, this this crazy man? Who, who says he can do all these things, who preaches all the time, who talks all the time, why would they lay down everything and follow him? What I believe Mark is doing is that he shows the power of Jesus. He shows how Jesus is so strong, he's so mighty, that Mark explains that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is the Messiah. And so you would be crazy not to follow him. You would be crazy not to drop everything and follow the one who has the power to heal, who has the power to do miracles, who has the power to do incredible things. When you see that Jesus has the power, when you see that Jesus is able, then what happens very quickly is that this call to discipleship isn't difficult. It's logical. When you see that Jesus knows the future, knows the present, and he knows your entire past. When he knows everything and he has it all under his control. That he is trustworthy. That he is loving. That he is faithful. That he's humble. It's easy to follow that kind of leader. I, I think in our, in our day and age, I think in our day and age, we've become so cynical. 
and, and maybe not you, maybe it's, maybe it's just me. Um, we become so cynical when it comes to people. Come so cynical when it comes to organized religion. So cynical when it comes to people in leadership. And again, maybe I'm just talking about myself. But I, I, I've become more cynical. And I think I need to repent. I do repent of my cynicism. Because my trust isn't in things of this world. My trust isn't in people in leadership. My trust isn't in things that have been created. My trust needs to be in the creator. And I think this is where I want to bridge the gap. I want to bridge the gap between non-believers and believers. That it's, it's not about being a radical. It's not about being insane and being crazy for Christ. It's about knowing who Jesus is. Knowing his power, knowing his love, knowing his grace, knowing that he loves you and he forgives you for everything that you've done and that he's calling you to follow him. He's calling you to witness not what you can do, but witness what he can do, what he has promised. And when we witness those things, our cynicism, my cynicism begins to wash away because I think my cynicism derives My jadedness derives from the fact that people fail. People fail all the time. Time and time again, when you put your trust in a person, they are going to fail you. Because they're human. Because they're imperfect. Because they're fallen. Like No one is perfect. And so I don't, it doesn't matter who you think of, the best person you could think of. They, at some point in their life, have done something wrong that if you really understood the depth of their sin or depth of their humanity, really, you would realize that putting them on a pedestal was uh, kind of foolish of you. Putting them on on this grand pedestal where you say like, man, they were a great person. That if you really looked into their lives, deep into their lives, you would realize, no, they were deeply human. And I don't have an anecdote for you because frankly, I don't, I don't need to humiliate or I don't need to, to, to tell you a story about someone in my life that I looked up to that they failed me. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't even need to bring up those scars of people in not only leadership, just people in my life that they failed me. And I think the, even, even thinking about what to talk about you know, in terms of people failing, a part of that is just, Saying, Lord, I, I, I'm sorry. Lord, I confess that I've put my trust in people on this earth. I've put my trust in, in, in leaders, in, in people in positions of authority, or, or people that I care about, in friends, in, in, in people that I hoped would love me or take care of me. And, and, and you know what? Yeah, I have great friends, but sometimes they failed me. Sometimes people close to me have failed me. And, and it, it becomes this, this game almost where you, you, have to go back and forth with who can I trust? You know, who, who can I open my heart out to? And, and I'm, I'm afraid that they're going to break my heart. I'm afraid that they're going to fail me. And so sometimes it's easier to not know about the people we care about. Sometimes it's easier to not know about the people we look up to. I, I mean, I think that's, that's kind of a strategy that many people have is that when you have someone you look up to, you just look up to them and you don't want to look at their flaws. You don't want to look at how messed up they really are because they're just going to disappoint you. And so we have this heart of cynicism. But what the book of Mark does so beautifully and wonderfully that brings so much hope to me that really... Uh, washes away that cynicism is that when you really look at Jesus and what he's done, he is the only one who is worthy of your trust. He's the only one that will never fail you, that will never leave you, that will never forsake you. If you've been hurt in the past, if you've, if you've been hurt in the past by, by someone, by anyone, if you have a relational pain, this message is for you. Because if you have a, had a relational pain in the past, this series is for you. Because there is that, that, that fear. There is that fear that Jesus might fail you. But Jesus will never fail you. Jesus will never leave you. He'll never forsake you. 
So at this time, we're going to go into um, Mark, Mark chapter 1, verse 40. And, and this is a story of Jesus healing a leper. And, and before I begin, um, the, the leprosy in, in the Bible is called leprosy, but leprosy is basically just any general skin disease. Uh, it may not be exactly the leprosy that we know today, but, but still, at the end of the day, a leprosy is the, uh, the skin disease um, that they saw as being very infectious, as very contagious. And so those that had leprosy were on the outside. They on the outskirts of society. Uh, they were they had they couldn't live within the city walls. They lived outside the city walls. They weren't allowed to do trade. They weren't allowed to go to the market like regular people. Uh, they were they were basically outcasts in every way. So in, in Mark chapter one verse forty says, and a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling. And kneeling, said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once. And said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. But he went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news, so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in desolate places, and people were coming to him from every quarter. And so again, during um, in this in this passage, there are a few things I underlined. Um, but really what this idea, this, this first point, um, that I want, I want us to, to meditate over is the faith of the leper. And I, I am losing it today, man. Things are just out of control. Okay. Um, is the faith, is the faith of the leper and, and the faith of the leper is, is something that I want to focus on because it's what the leper says to Jesus. And, and let me, let me just go back for a moment, um, to, to what he says to Jesus. He says, if you will, you can make me clean. And, and I, the reason why I want to focus on this is that this, this leper, he, he prays. And again, he's talking to Jesus. He is, he is saying to Jesus what, uh, you know, a prayer that I, I I can only dream and wish of is being able to speak to Jesus face to face. But this leper's prayer begins so, so simply. And, and, and the, the prayer is, if you will, you can make me clean. If we can learn a prayer today, if, if you and I can learn a prayer, is, it is this prayer. If you will, you can make me clean. And, and the reason why I, I think it's different than many times the way we pray even if we believe in Jesus, you may believe that he is the savior of the world, that he died and rose again for your faith, uh, for your sins. And it's by your faith that you are saved. But this prayer is such an amazing one because it, it teaches us how to pray for healing. It t- teaches us how to pray to Jesus because he, he received an answer from Christ. But the, the prayer was not a demand. It was not, Jesus, you have to heal me. It was not, Jesus, you're the only one who can heal me, so you better heal me. It's not this arrogant prayer of saying, Jesus, I'm sick. I'm an outcast. I feel sorry for myself. God has abandoned me. He he has forsaken me. I, I have to live outside the city walls and my life just sucks. So do something about it, Jesus. And I, I just do anything. Do whatever you want. But right now, life is just terrible and I feel terrible. No. The, the leper, his prayer, his prayer was, if you will, you can heal me. You have the power. His focus wasn't on his situation. His focus was on the power of Jesus. His focus is on what Jesus is able to do. And he states what Jesus is able to do. That Jesus, of course, Jesus is able to heal him. Jesus, of course, has the power to heal. And, and this, is, this is really where you and I, 
need to wrestle with this belief. What is your faith of who Jesus is? Do you believe Jesus fed the 5,000? Do you believe Jesus walked on water? Do you believe Jesus healed this leper? Do you believe that Jesus was able to resurrect Lazarus from the dead? I mean, do you believe Jesus was able to turn water into wine? Do you believe that Jesus rose from the dead? See, I think think the basis, the foundation of our faith, the foundation of our belief doesn't begin with us. The foundation of our faith begins with who we have faith in. Is Jesus worthy of your faith? Is he worthy of your trust? I think the leper kind of came down to that conclusion. Yeah, Jesus, he's already been healing a bunch of people. I, I've, I've heard their stories. I've heard their, their testimonies of the power of Jesus. But the leper never experienced the power of Jesus. The leper did not experience firsthand the power of Jesus before he met Jesus. Yet he had faith. See, I've heard this so many times, and I hope you're able to follow with me here. I've heard so many times from from people, and again, this is just being in ministry and, and talking to people about faith. Many times people won't have faith in God until God does something for them. You hear me? Many times people don't have faith in God until God does something for them. That's backwards. The faith of the leper had faith in God before God did a single thing for him. The faith, the foundation of the faith of the leper was to say, God, you can do it. If it's in your will, you absolutely can heal me of this leprosy. I believe. I mean, essentially, it's this statement of faith that the leopard, leper, not the leopard, the leper is saying to Jesus, is, I believe you can heal me. If it's in your will, you will he- you, you can heal me. You, you, you are able to heal me. But again, in, in, in kind of modern day faith, um, what I've seen so many times with people and their faith in, in God is we make ultimatums with God. Because God, unless you heal me, unless you heal my mom, unless you heal my dad, unless you give me success, unless you, unless you do the things that, that I want you to do, unless, unless you give me a spouse, unless you give me a child, unless you, you know, give me, give me everything that I desire, I'm not going to believe in you. I'm not going to go to church. I'm not going to worship you. I'm not going to pray to you until you do what you are able to do count me out. I'll just be a substitute. I'll just, I'll just go and I'll just, you know, kind of show my face every once in a while, but I'm not going to have real faith until you really do what you're able to do. The faith of the leper was to say, Lord, I have this leprosy. You see it. I I have this skin disease and it's caused me so much trouble. It's caused me so much pain, so much suffering, but I believe that you have the power to heal me of this leprosy. You have the power to heal me of the skin disease that has caused me so much pain. And if it's in your will, you are able to save me from this. But it's only if you're willing. The faith of the leper is strong because it's not dependent on Jesus healing him. The faith of the leper is strong because he has faith that Jesus can do it. The next thing that I want to put your attention to as the heart of Christ. And if you remember back to it, when we read this, uh, there is a, there, I underlined the word pity. Jesus had pity on this man with leprosy. And I think we've put so much negative connotation to what it means to pity someone. And I talked about this in a pat in a, in a message before. Um, but, but pity in terms of the Greek word that's used for pity, it really means to have compassion on someone. To, to look at someone and, and to feel empathy for them, to feel for their situation, that, that they're hurting and, and you understand their pain and you understand how much suffering they're going through. And so Jesus, seeing how much suffering this man was going through, he had pity on him. But it's not the, again, it's not the, the negative connotation of pity that he looks down on him. No, but it's like he, he is this 
pitiful thing. He's this pitiful man that's just dealing with this intense skin disease, this intense leprosy, and and he's just been ostracized and living this this life of suffering. And so, yeah, Jesus has pity on this person, and and the heart of Christ is so beautiful. It's so beautiful because as he has pity on this man, as he has compassion on this man, he is willing to heal him. But I think this is another lesson of what it means to be a follower of Christ, to be a disciple of Christ. Again, it's first about the faith. It's first about having faith that Jesus can heal you. Absolutely, that Jesus can heal you. But here's my second question to you. is: Are you pitiful without Christ? Are you pitiful without Jesus? And this is not comfortable in any way to wrestle with. To be pitiful? Like, I don't want to be pitiful. Why would I want to be pitiful? Why would I want to be um, in, in need of compassion? I don't want to be in need. I want to be strong. Like, I want to be, I want to be a superhero. I want to be tough. I want to be, you know, I want to be fit. I want to be successful. I want to be the one who people come to for help. I don't want to be pitiful. Jesus, what do you mean you look at me with pity? I don't want God to look at me with pity. I'm not a pitiful thing. I'm a strong person. I'm a strong man. You know, I'm able to stand on my my two feet. I think a part of being a disciple of Christ is accepting the pity of Christ. Is accepting his compassion. I think there's a reason why those those people, the people that have hit rock bottom, really turn their life when they meet Jesus. The, the, the people that hit rock bottom, they, they hit that point where they have nowhere else to go. That when they find Jesus, Jesus is so comforting and he's so sweet and he's so wonderful. He's so beautiful. Is because they understand that when Jesus has pity on them, when Jesus has compassion on them, it is a good thing. It is a great thing. It's a wonderful thing. Would Jesus having pity on you be a good thing for your life? Or is it completely unnecessary? I think a part of being a disciple is saying, Jesus, have pity on me. Have have compassion for me. Because I am so broken. I am so incomplete without you. I am such a sinful person. I, I, I am so rotten to the core. Please have pity on me. Have mercy on me. Because I... Right now, everything's falling apart. The heart of a disciple, the heart of a disciple is is to accept the compassion of Christ. Is to accept, accept his mercy. See, if you want to be a disciple, but you want to be a haughty one, if you want to be arrogant, if you want to say, hey, I don't need, I don't need the pity of Christ. I don't need his mercy. I don't, I don't need his grace. Do you, do you hear how that he doesn't even sound like a disciple? I, I think so many times when it comes to following Jesus, we, we, we lose sight of what really got us into the faith in the first place. When it becomes about being a disciple, we think it's all about being in leadership. <laughs> we think it's about leading people to Christ. We, we hear that over and over again. Lead people to Christ. Lead people to Jesus. You, you be the worker. You be the one who is, who is going forth and trailblazing. That you're doing the work. That sometimes what happens is we begin to think, okay, I am like Peter. I am like Paul. I'm like Timothy. I'm like all these amazing people amazing people that we see in the Bible. And I'm going to have this great faith. I'm going to have this great faith in Jesus. And Jesus is going to use me in mighty ways. But I think what we need to understand, even with characters like Peter and Paul, is that the reason why God used them, the, the way that God used them is Jesus had pity on them. And he chose them out of that pity, out of that compassion. I mean, really, take the, the life of Saul or, or Paul. He was this intense, intense Pharisee who was killing the early church, who was imprisoning them. And, and, and really, anyone who was talking about Jesus, he was just 
he was just going at them. He was just persecuting the early church with to no end. And and he meets Jesus and he goes blind. And I think it's that going blind, that that part of his life where he sees Jesus and and Jesus is saying, Paul, Saul, why are you killing my church? Why are you persecuting my church? And Paul goes blind and, and Jesus has pity on this man. He has enough pity to meet him, to confront him. And I think Paul had to accept that pity, had to accept how pitiful he was. And I think that's what leads him to his conversion. I mean, look at, look at the life of Peter. Peter being this haughty and arrogant disciple as he's following Jesus. This is why there's hope for everyone. There's hope for people like me. That he's this arrogant person who's constantly living in ministry while Jesus is alive. And he's always the, the one in the front lines, always saying the first thing that comes out of his mouth. And, and when Jesus is being imprisoned, Peter denies Jesus three times. Denies him three times. And yet Jesus doesn't forsake him. Jesus just doesn't, doesn't say, okay, Peter, you denied me three times and so I'm done with you. Jesus fully restores him. Jesus makes, makes Peter one of the fathers of the early church. Being a disciple is understanding the heart of Christ. It's understanding that Jesus has pity on you. He has compassion for you. He has mercy for you. Can you accept that? Can you really make that and a part of that your life? That yes, I am worthy of the pity of Christ. I am a pitiful. It's, it sounds weird even when I say it. <laughs> because I, I think, again, just follow along with me here. Naturally, like what I want to do is I want to puff you up. I want to boost you up. You're not pitiful. You're you're strong. Like you are strong. And I want to add, you are strong in the Lord. You are mighty. You are mighty in the Lord. That you that you can go and you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. And those are good things to hear. And those are good things to know. But what I'm trying to get you to understand is that the strength that you have, the strength that comes from the Lord, the strength that we cling on to is not yours. It's his. And for you to unlock the strength of Christ, you need to surrender your own strength. You need to accept his pity. You need to accept his mercy. You need to accept his compassion. So many of us want our strength in conjunction with the strength of Christ. No. The only way for us to unlock the strength of Christ is, is to understand how weak we are without him. The leper understood how weak he was, understood his weakness without Christ. That's why when he went to Jesus, he said, I know you have the power to heal me. You have the ability to make me clean. And Jesus had pity on him. And so the last perspective or the last piece of this puzzle that's not even really mentioned here in, uh, in Mark is the perspective of the disciples. I mean, you see, the disciples are just watching this. They're watching this leper come to Jesus and say, I have faith in you. I, I, I believe in you, that you can heal me. And Jesus having pity on this person, they're watching this inner interchange. But there's something that I wanted to, to really help us understand even more so is that the perspectives of the disciples is learning the logic of Jesus. See, they're beginning the ministry. We're still in Mark chapter one. So this is the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. And so if you're a disciple of Jesus, you're probably thinking to yourself, how can we make this thing lucrative? How can we make this, this, this ministry run smoothly? How can we make sure that we have enough money to have a long thriving, uh, a longevity in our ministry? 
because again, people are giving money. You know, uh, even we know Judas. Judas is in charge of the money bag, and so it's not like they're they're completely destitute and just uh, walking around doing nothing. People are giving their alms to Christ, and so if you're a disciple, you're probably thinking to yourself, how can we make sure that this this ministry can continue? How can we make sure that this ministry is is going to succeed years after years, decade after decade? That we're going to make sure Jesus is is strong and mighty. Or perhaps another way is, is that the disciples viewing Jesus as the Messiah, there is this understanding that the Messiah is going to overthrow the Romans, that the Messiah is going to be in the seat of power, is going to have an uprising against, against the, their oppressors. And so you would think from the disciples' perspective, they would be like, okay, we need to have as big of a following as we can because if we're going to go to war with the Romans, if we're going to fight the Romans and take over you know, take over Jerusalem again, so we kick out guys like Pontius Pilate, we're going to kick out the, our, our Roman governors, you know, we need as many people as we can. I think something that the disciples learned is that Jesus was not interested in fame. Jesus was not interested in that kind of growth. He was not interested in being a spectacle. Jesus was interested in just doing the will of the Father. And so what happens is he even tells the leper very sternly, don't tell anyone that it was me. He, and he's not saying don't tell anyone what happened. He wants the leper to go to the temple, go to the priests and Proclaim what God has done. Jesus' humility is so strong that he tells this man, go to the temple and, and basically proclaim what God has done for you. But just don't tell them that it was from me. Don't tell them that it was me. It was, it was I, Jesus, who did it. Keep that part a secret. Jesus wants God to get all the glory. I think the disciples learned a lesson at this time because how easy would it have been for Jesus to say, Hey, let everyone know that it was Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah, Jesus Christ who healed you. Let everyone know that they can line up and I'll be here to heal them whenever they want. Uh, I'll be here 24 seven that they know that if they, if they, you know, give this much money or if they, if they follow me for this long, that I will heal them of their sickness. I will heal them of the, their disease. If you follow me for X amount of years, then you will be one of my disciples. I'll put you on the fast track of leadership and I'll make sure that, that, you know, I put you in charge of making, uh, you know, this, this cell church, you know, this community will, will spread and will, will franchise and we'll make our, our, our ministry as big as possible. Jesus told this man, don't tell anyone about what I did to you, but go to the temple and, and, and get the, the priests to, to say that you've been made clean. Jesus it does this so many times in, in the gospels where he doesn't want the credit. He doesn't want the, the fame. He doesn't want the accolade. He doesn't want the followers. He wants people to simply follow God. He wants them to understand the father's heart. He wants them to understand the good news that Jesus has come to save the world, not to condemn it, but to save it. I, I, I truly hope you, you take that to heart. It's not about what our church can do. It's not about what I can do. It's not about our fame or our accolade or how big we are or, or how great we become. I think that goes against what the gospel is teaching us, what Jesus is teaching us. He's giving us an outline of what it means to be a Christian is that you and I need to do the work of the Lord. You and I need to just follow and do what God is telling us to do like Jesus, how he was just doing what his father was telling him to do. But it's not for your accolade. It's not for you to get an attaboy, for you to get a pat on the back to say, hey, good job and let everyone know how great you are, how wonderful you are. No, the answer isn't about your fame. The answer isn't about how great you are so you can write an autobiography or have someone write a biography about how great of a person you are. The part about being a disciple of Jesus is being like Jesus. And Jesus was not in, interested in fame or fortune. He was simply interested in doing the work of his father.
I hope and I pray that you wrestle with this idea of discipleship. You wrestle with this idea of what it means to follow Jesus. I, I pray that you would wrestle with your faith. Do you actually believe that Jesus is capable of doing miracles? Do you actually believe that he is capable of healing? He is capable of healing you, not only of your physical ailments, but he's able to heal you of your sin. Because if you believe that, that is a strong foundation to faith, is if you believe that he is trustworthy. Do you believe that Jesus is stronger than you? That he has a right to have pity on you? Do you understand that he loves you? That he really, he really wants to show compassion to you? You know, I think, I think for me, um, I've been let down by people in my life. And I think we've all been let down by people in one way or another. If anything, I probably let you down in many ways. Um, we've all been, we've all been let down by people. And I think that's because we have faith in people. We so easily put our faith, our investments in people, and we hope in people. What it means to be a disciple is simple. That you take that faith, take that faith you have in people, and transfer it over to Jesus. Take that faith that you have in yourself. That self-help books will tell you over and over again. These, these self-help gurus that will tell you, you just need to have faith in yourself. Have faith that you can do it. It's the, it's the power of positive thinking. If you think it, if you believe it, you can achieve it. And take that faith and transfer it over to the one who is worthy of that faith. If you do that, you will be a disciple of Christ. If you take that faith you have in people and in yourself and you transfer that over to Jesus, the one who is worthy, you are a disciple of Christ. I miss seeing you guys. I, I, I miss seeing you throughout this, this whole process and there's a worry in me. It's like, you know, we've been uh, gone from each other for so long. You know, uh, it's this worry that's like, man, our church is just useless. Our church is ineffective. It's not able. And I, 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 I've been thinking about, you know, feeling that feeling of just like, oh, God, what can we do? And I think it's a healthy place to be. I think it's a healthy place to be, to feel ineffective. To feel like right now, like, Lord, I just is groaning like, oh, my, like our church our church, my church, like we, we, we can't do anything. We're so ineffective. Y'all, this is the best place to be. Because what I'm asking is God, have pity on us. Have pity on us. It's not about what we can do, but you can do something amazing through us. You can do something amazing through us even during this time of pandemic. You can do something amazing through us. So Lord, have pity on us. Because you can do an amazing work in us. It's not about our fame. It's not about our accolades. It's all about you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. And, and Lord, um, I pray that you would just be with us. Help us to be humble before you. Uh, Lord, that we would understand that we are not in charge. That we are not strong. That we are not mighty. And so Lord, have pity on us because we're weak. Have pity on us because we are broken. And Lord, you can make us strong. You can make us mighty. You can make us effective. But without you, Lord, we're nothing. Without you, we are, we are sick. We are tired. We are hungry. But with you, we are healed. We are full. We are mighty. And so Lord, help us to be that kind of community a kind of community that is not a, that is not arrogant that is not prideful but lord as we go through the ups and downs of life give us that heart of a true disciple a disciple that just looks and focuses on doing your will and your bidding we love you and in jesus name we pray